looking at 1 Samuel 16. We're looking at verses 14 through 23. And we're talking about the fact that this is King Saul. They've, they've been in a period of uh, judges. And the book of Judges closes that closes with the statement that uh, evil was prevalent and everybody did what was right in their own eyes and they, they didn't give a hoot what God had to say. That's my translation of that text. Um, Saul comes along as the king and he and he and God because he's the king the God in the Old Testament the, the spirit did not indwell you the Holy Spirit didn't dwell you in the Old Testament it came alongside you or came upon you to do specific tasks for the Lord when that task was over the Lord would withdraw the Holy Spirit from you because it was there to fulfill a, a mission Saul under under this ministry of the Holy Spirit is king got where he wouldn't obey the details of the directive will of God. Now, when you, you know, you study the word to get the will of God. From the word comes the will, and from the will comes the work of the Lord. In that order, that's the order. And the will of God, we, it has three classifications in the Bible. It can be the directive will of God. That's what he directs you to do. He tells you specifically. There can be the permissive will of God. What God permits you volitionally to do in regard to the directive will. For example, Jonah. He tells him to go to Nineveh and preach the gospel. He's not going to do it. He gets on a boat and goes the other way. Now he's in trouble. God permits it as long as it doesn't interfere with the directive will. All right? the, over, the bigger picture. And then there is the overruling will of God. That's when God says, okay, enough's enough. Now, now, you're, messing, now you're messing with the plan, and so he interferes with it. Uh, he, he, he winds up over, over the boat, right? They throw him out. He f sinks to the bottom, and a fish picks him up. Story of Jonah. All right? So what was happening with King Saul is the directive will was given to him and there were details. You know, there, there was point one, point two, point three. They're like, here are four steps. Well, he does one, won't do the other three. And God says, hey, I don't buy that. When I tell you, when I tell you this is my will and I tell you I want these four things done, I want these four things done. One doesn't cover four. Four covers four. <laughs> And so he started having a pattern in his life where he would do some of the will of God and not all the will of God. And God put a, put a stop to that business. So at some point, which is chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, the Lord says, I reject you as king. Under my program, you're no longer king. Now you're going to, pull your, you're going to finish your tour, but I'm no longer supporting your kingship. Now he's in trouble. And when he does that, he removes the Holy Spirit from him. That's Old Testament. That would never happen in New Testament because John 14, 16. First of all, he dwells inside you, and he dwells inside you forever. But this is Old Testament. The reason this happens in the church age is because you live in the age of Messiah. Christ has come. He's left, and he's coming again. This is the age of Messiah. This is age, we live in the age of Christ. So here we are, and this is now happening. Saul has rejected the word consistently. There's a pattern in his behavior, so he removes the Holy Spirit. As far as God is concerned, you're king and title, and that's all. And uh, he'll, let him, he'll let him fulfill his reign because God is planning for the next guy. In fact, Right away in this chapter and next chapter, he's going to uh, he's going to appoint David, and he's going to uh, well he's going to anoint David to be king. Sa Samuel is, and uh, but it'll be several years before he becomes king. But anyhow, my point was verse fifteen, where it says Saul's servants. This is the people who worked for the king, the king's cabinet and staff. They recognize, behold, an evil spirit from God is terrorizing him. 
mean, people knew that. I mean, they didn't say, well, boy, he's having a bad day. Oh, boy, um, he's a little wacky. I, whoa, I think if you lived with him, you'd go like, I think he might be insane. And if you know anything about Saul's life after chapter 16, you know he went, he went that way and because an evil spirit was on him. Okay? Verse 16. And so they give him advice. This is, this is his counsel. This is counsel to the king. It's like, let our Lord now command your servants who are before you. Let them seek a man who is a skillful player on the harp. Uh, we might call that a guitar. Uh, and it shall come about when the evil spirit from God is on you, they tell him, that he shall play the harp with his hand and you will be well. Now, look, this is so important. Listen to me. Now, listen, this is really important. It's not the harp that's going to do this. I mean, all right? But they saw that they saw that what they would call in their day soft music had an effect on people that were being terrorized by evil spirits. I don't know if that actually worked or not. But I can tell you, an evil spirit don't give a hoot about what music you play. They come from another age, right? These are fallen angels that, go, that are before the foundation of the earth. The, you know, they might like hip-hop. I don't know. But I can tell you, it doesn't affect the, what they're going to do, right? But this story gets really interesting because the guy they picked was successful. And he wasn't successful because he could play a good guitar. He wasn't, listen, this job wasn't about to get the top of the charts. Okay? It's not going to lead this guy to be one of the great guitarists of the world. But it is going to lead him to be one of the great kings. So Saul said to his servants, provide for me now a man who can play well. Bring him to me. Then one of the young men answered and said, Behold, I've seen, a, I've seen a young guy, Jesse of Bethlehem, who is a skillful musician. He's a mighty man of valor. He's a warrior. He's prudent in speech. In other words, he's a smart guy. He's a handsome man. And the, watch this now. And the Lord is with him. Out of all the characteristics of this young man, the one that's going to be the most meaningful to Saul in his nutty stage, i.e. the evil spirit, is going to be the guy that comes in that's with the Lord. Can I tell you something right here? You are that guy. You are the guy with the Lord. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead to give you personally eternal life, you're saved. Romans 1.16 says the gospel, and I just explained it, Christ died, here's how I explain it, Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, that's the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, nothing less than that is a gospel, listen, if he just dies on a cross, that don't make him a savior, you know why, three guys died that day on a cross, so which one is the real Messiah, they're all three going to die that day, the one who was raised from the dead on the third day, as he predicted. The gospel is that he died on the cross for, for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead to give us eternal life. Romans 1.16 says, The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. You don't get it by going to church. You don't get it by, quote, cleaning up your life. Doing good, or playing a mean guitar, or singing in a rock band for the Lord. It's not the way you're going to get it. You're going to get it because you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. You ever read the obituary? You should start doing that. Especially if you don't think this is true. If you don't think that's true, then you should read the obituary 
And, and look, every day you should read it and look for somebody your age who has just died. Then tell me how long you got. Now how long you hope you have. And whether or not you ought to be serious about whether you should believe the gospel of Jesus Christ now. Because there may not be a later. I did. I bury people of all ages. Well, we found a man. So Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David who is with the flock. So Jesse took a donkey, loaded it with bread, and a jug of wine, and a young goat, and sent him to Saul by David his son. David came to Saul and attended him, and Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer, his, his confidant. He didn't move anywhere without him. He, told, he would say something like this, take your sword and guitar. I may need them both before I get back home. Then David came to Saul and attended him, and Saul loved him. Ver, next verse. Saul sent to Jesse saying, let David now stand before me for he has found favor in my sight. In other words, he's hired him. Every father likes to hear that, doesn't he? Somebody, somebody actually hired my kid. Who would have believed that? So it came about whenever the evil spirit from God came to Saul, whenever, and it wasn't permanent, whenever. In, that, in other words, you know, who, you know who runs the demons? You know who's over the demons? Satan. Satan is. Satan is. They don't even, they're not in charge of their own life. Ephesians, the sixth chapter. So whenever, whenever Saul had something important, I'm sure the devil sent him out, right, with an evil spirit to make his day miserable, prevent him from doing anything. David would take the harp and he would play it with his hand and Saul would be refreshed and would be well and the evil spirit would depart from him. Guess they don't like music after all. <coughs> you think that's so? all? I'll tell you who they didn't like. They didn't like the guy who played it. The guy who before he played it said, could we have a word of prayer? We'll pray to God the Father. Let us have a great day. So let me pause with prayer with you. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells in your, your body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20, your bodies become the temple of God. The temple of God, your bodies become the temple of God. The place where God dwells because of the work of Christ on the cross, burial and resurrection, the gospel. And he's there for you to be a spiritual person. You're a spiritual person because of the Holy Spirit's ministry in your life. The Holy Spirit, when he comes in, he's never permitted to leave until the end of your life. John 14, 16. He's there to make you a spiritual person. You're not there. You're not, you don't make yourself a spiritual person, people. So, what do I have to do? You can't study the Bible carnal. You can't study it in the flesh. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people. The Holy Spirit's been given us in the church age to teach you the Word of God. And the Word of God will revolutionize your life. It's the only power sufficient. It's the, the gospel, the word of God. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The word of God is the power of God unto every aspect of your life. That's your power system. So if I'm carnal, how do I know it? There's personal sin in your life. Mental attitude sin, sins of the tongue, of earth sin, something like that. What should I do? You got to confess it. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. So you need to do that before we study. Okay? Get that business done. You do it silently. You do it to yourself. It needs to be done. Only you know what sin is, and only you know what you've done, and only you can correct it. Father, we're thankful tonight for these who have come our way to study with us. We pray, Father, we would learn about Satan's reconnaissance 
upon believers and what his motive in it is and how he operates and how we can buffet him, how we can, how we can control our life and him from it. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We've looked at our text tonight. This is an extension from last week, and I don't know how many more weeks I might do this. Uh, I might be through with tonight, or I might come back to it. But what's interesting is the word terrorize. In, in my Bible, maybe your Bible might say torment. I don't know what your Bible might say, but the, the New American... The New American Standard is, is, is going to be somewhere around terrorize, but it could mean torment, could be torment or terrorize. Actually, the word in Hebrew, I'll show it to you in the Hebrew language. In Hebrew, you read from the right to the left. And here, I'm going to, I'm going to put this, this is the vocabulary of this word. So just so you understand that sometimes the difference in er, in words. In Hebrew, you read from the right to the left. That's a B. These are vowels. That's an A. That's silent. It doesn't have a letter. So we got another A and then we got a TH. This word in Hebrew is bath. Like, I'm going to go take a bath. And this word actually, and it's a PL perfect in the Hebrew language. And PL is an intensive stem. In other words, when the, when the evil spirit came upon him, he came upon him. The word terrorize is, is, is like a figurative of speech in this. The literal word means to fall upon somebody. The reason is terrorize is the purpose. But this word, this word bath in the Hebrew actually means to fall upon somebody. Like some, maybe catching somebody in ambush. You know, uh, in a minor way, um, kids always like to hide behind doors or something, and somebody comes along and they jump out and try to scare you. Um, in big time life, then somebody does the same thing with a gun or a hatchet or something, and now, now we're terrorized. You understand what I mean? When they j fall upon you or jump out upon you, then it terrorizes you. There's a, a, an element of fear, right? This is this word. This is this word. And, and how the English translated this word to fall upon, to do something, they, they carried it in the worst sense, right? Instead of just somebody trying to scare you, you know, you know. Um, and little kids, when they have that done, parents do it to little kids, right? And they go like, <laughs> I love that, right? It, it, they go nuts, and they go like, I like that. Then you'll see them do it to all their siblings. Now, now you've got a mess on your hand because they, they hide behind everything and jump out and, and uh, do that, right? But that's, that's the mild stage of this. This here is taking it to a way different level. This, this, you understand that? And, and so they, they translate it, torment or terrorize. This is that word. And this is going to be in Saul's life on and off for the rest of his life. Now, he's a believer. This does not make him an unbeliever. He's still a believer. But this, this aspect in his life is going to be all the way to the end now. Okay? And this evil spirit upon him is designed to terrorize him. This is not somebody jumping out going, whoo, a little scare you, and then you go, oh, and then they hug you and go like, it's okay. This is the guy who jumps behind the door with, door with a hatchet would do you. His intention is to terrorize you. Not to go like, boo, 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 boo. Okay? But it's a trans, we call it a transliteration. Just to show you the intensity of how it affected him. That's a demon affecting him. It's not, it's, and he's not there all the time, right? He comes and goes. And he's on assignment by the guy who runs this whole program, which is Satan. Satan runs this whole program. Think we have demons today? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sure have them. They're, they're here. They're here. Listen, Satan and his group run all the way to the millennium. Then they're removed from the earth for a thousand years and then turned back loose. And you're going to have the war of Gog and Magog.
right? So here's my point. This right here, this is going to be a lifestyle of living. This, his life is dramatically going to change. As a believer, it's going to change. He's going to change. His life, his life is going to be under that kind of function. Okay? Let's see what else I have here. When it says, when David would play the harp, he would, he would be well. No, no. That, that's not what it actually says. That's not, because I think when you hear the word, if you're sick and you get well, you're well from that sickness. Now, you may get sick again, or you may relapse. That's not this word. This word is that's that word that's R A W A C H that word this is a word that means be relieved relief yeah well that's what the the demon does for you and then you get real Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get temporary relief. Yeah. Is what you get. Basically like when you get a bunion on your foot, you take the shoe off, but you got to put it back on because you're on your way back to work. Yeah. That's yeah. You still, the, the, still going to be there. Yeah, still going to be there. Uh, and so this is very interesting because this is not the word well. This is the word relief. And, and it too is a figure of speech. It too is a figure of speech. In other words, um, I, I, they translate this, I don't know how other translations translate, but it actually means, um, I think maybe they might have even used this word with like refreshed. He became refreshed. The spirit left him and he'd be, but actually when, this, when the spirit would be removed from him, he'd get relief from being tormented or from being terrorized. Have somebody jump out with a hatchet on you every time you turned around, you know. <laughs> so, I mean. You, you want Halloween to get over quick in your life, don't you? And and, and that ain't going to happen. Um, so this is important. Um, we are left to wonder why the Lord did this to Saul, right? We are left to wonder. But here's here's what we know. Here's what we know. You say, well, why would the Lord do that to him? Here's what, here, here's what the Lord said. In 1 Samuel 13, 13 and 14, now I'm in 16, but earlier... Samuel, the prophet, said to the king, Saul, here's the answer. You have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commands of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now, the Lord, would, for now, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now, your kingdom shall not endure. And then in the 15th chapter, verses 19 through 21, which we've studied, he came right back and told him the same thing. He said, your, 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 the, your failure is not keeping the will of God. The whole details, the details of the will of God. Now, Saul said, I don't understand what you're talking about. You told me to go out and commit, to, to go to war. I went out and did war. He said, yeah, but I told you exactly how, how I wanted the war to go. And you didn't do that. So, you know, listen, he's like so many people who study the Bible. They study it in general. They know a little bit about some things and nothing about the real things that matter. They got a general idea. But you see, we don't live in generality. We live in specifics. I got a job. What do you do? I work at, yeah, what do you do? I go to work at Monday, Tuesday, what do you do? Because <laughs> that's what you do is what you get paid for. <laughs> and if you don't do what's on your job description, then you don't get paid at the end of the week. You get fired. So that's what we're talking about. I want, to, I want to talk about four things because what is important in this story to you and I is Satan's reconnaissance. His reconnaissance. 
And I tell you, you have no idea how much he pays attention to you. Oh, you go like, now, Ron, he, and I hear this all the time, he probably pays a lot of attention to you because you study the Bible a lot. But he don't pay any attention to me. Yeah, if you walk for God any, he does. Now, if you don't walk for God, if you live like a heathen out there, yeah, then you're right because he's already got you. But if you're trying to stumble your way through life for God, you're a threat. You're a threat. You are a threat to him. And so he runs reconnaissance. He doesn't run reconnaissance on people who are out in the Thule's. He runs on reconnaissance on people who, who he, he hears them say, I want to get serious about God. I want to get serious about living for Christ. I want to get serious about going to church. I want to get serious about studying the Word of God. And they do. It's not the guy who says, I'm going to. I'm going to do that. Can't get up on Sunday. Can't go to church on Tuesday. Can't go to church when it's open. Can't do it. But you yeah, yeah, don't worry about that guy. That, that, that guy's already done. He's already cooked goose ready to be eaten. It's this guy who says this because he knows it's the right thing to do and then puts his mind. He said, I'm going to do this. And he gets up and he tells the family, we're going to church. Oh, why are we going to church? I want to sleep in. Nope, going to church. Going to church. We never went to church before. We are now. Well, I don't want to get dressed up. Where we go, you don't have to. You can come to church on, with some, any day here like you're dressed. We don't care. I have something on, but, you know, whatever your money can afford is all right with us. We don't care. We're not interested in your clothes. We don't run contests in here. But we are interested in the fact that you pull yourself on your, on your weekend when you got downtime and come to church and say, La -de -la. listen, I'm influencing my family. Listen, if I can't win my family, what am I doing? So let me tell you, this is important to Daddy. We're going to do this. I don't know. Just, I'm just talking a little bit with you. But he runs reconnaissance. He runs reconnaissance on what I call believers who say I'm going to be spiritual. I've been carnal. I don't like it. I have not lived for God. I don't like it. My life's screwed up. My life's a mess. And I know who made it. I made it. I've made all the bad decisions in my life. It wasn't me praying to God, oh, God. No, I only did that prayer when I got in deep trouble. Then I went, oh, God. And he went, boy, have you, but look, you've created a real mess. What you got, big guy? A spider. Come right out of that pot. No, you can... <laughs> That's a spider plant. Thank you. If that thing had climbed down and got over to Pam, we'd have, we'd have understood this word terrorized. We'd have had a visual example of terrorized. Now, let me show you reconnaissance, both in the Old Testament and New Testament. I'm going to show you Satan's reconnaissance. Listen, listen when you leave this church, he's going to run reconnaissance on you. He knows who we are. That's it, right? But we don't care. We, we kill them and go on. We don't care. Get me distracted. I can get back on track. Now, there's two, two examples, Book of Job and First Peter. These two books will give you good examples of Satan's reconnaissance. He does it, and, and we're talking about believers. In the Old Testament, he does it with Job. Listen to what, in the first chapter and second chapter of Job. In the first chapter, the Lord says to Satan, from where do you come? Now, pay attention to this. Now, God knows where you come from and going, right? This is interrogation. This is, you spill your guts when you get with God. None of that, well, uh, uh, I don't know where I was last night, tell you the truth. Uh, oh, uh, oh, oh, yeah, well, um, <laughs> when you're with God, you have to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you. Uh, oh, the, oh, I see, I with God. <laughs> The Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Satan answered the Lord, and you better be, don't be, no, when you stand for God, you're before a truth serum. 
He says, from roaming about on the earth and walking around it. Well, that's just what you're supposed to do. That's, you know, God runs the whole system. You do know that. I mean, he, he controls the whole kit and caboodle. Even Satan knows that. That's why he's standing before him, and God's not standing before Satan. Satan's standing before God. Don't get that backwards. The Lord said to Satan, that's the first chapter. Here's the second, and he, and he comes up a second time. You know, he whacks, he whacks J J J uh, uh, Job, right? He goes like, well, let me have a little piece of Job, and I'll tell you what he'll do. He'll curse you to your face. And so he says, well, you can do, but you can't mess with his life. You, you, can, have a, you can have a part of him, but you can't kill him. And he goes, all right. Listen, I can put the whammy on him. He'll curse the day he ever, he ever met you. Well, he, he took everything he had from him. He took his family, right? He took his, his money. He took his, everything he had from him. He took all the details of life from him. You know what? Job didn't blink an eye, said, praise God. Naked I came into the world and naked I leave. Everything I have belongs to God. Take it all. I came into this world naked. I'm going to leave this. But the, the only reason I'm in this world is to connect myself up with God. That's true with you and me too, by the way. Listen, if I walked through this whole earth, if I owned everything and missed God, I'd be a loser. No matter what the world told me. So he comes a second time. Because Job, Job ain't cursed him. Job is all about praise God, praise God, praise God. Listen, this is a guy who pr says praise God means it. Not just one of these Sunday guys. Doesn't, he's, not, he's not doing that Saturday night. He ain't got his hand up in the bar going like, praise God, praise God, praise God. Give another round, praise God, praise God. He's not doing that. This guy's for real. He's not a phony baloney. So he comes before the, the Lord a second time, Job the second chapter. The Lord says to Satan, have you considered, he asked him the same question, what have you been doing? Well, he said, I've been roaming, I've been roaming, I've been roaming, and hunt. I've been on a hunting mission. I've been hunting. I've been out hunting. Have you considered my servant Job? There's no man like him on the earth, blameless, upright, fearing God, turning away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him and his house and all this stuff? And he does it. He does it two times, Job. The next time he said, "Listen, let me have him this time. I I guarantee he will curse the day he met you, God. Because I will I will I will strip the flesh off his body. And boy, did he did he ever do it. I mean, he put worms on him that ate his flesh. Put worms on him. You know, I was saying the other day about this this." water bacteria that eat flesh eating that's what that's the kind of stuff this guy had on him well what are you doing satan well i'm roaming i'm on a hunting mission i'm doing reconnaissance trying tr looking at a bunch of your people well have you looked at job no well i've looked at him reconnaissance listen to what he said i looked at him i took a good look at him but you got a fence around him and I hear him singing there, don't fence me in. <laughs> and so, listen, he, he done the reconnaissance. He said, I have, but you got a hedge around him. You got it built on every side. You've blessed the works of his hands and possess all the things he possess. It just, you've just blessed him. It just everything he touches turns to gold. Huh. Yeah. I've done reconnaissance. I have you considered my my now? Do you suppose God knows He's runs can it, God? He runs it because God allows it. And listen, He's run good reconnaissance, hasn't He? Oh yeah. I I listen. We've checked all the walls, all the doors, all the windows. We can't get in. Now isn't that good to know, my dear brother in Christ? Huh? In the New Testament, we have the same thing. In 1 Peter, on your paper, in 1 Peter 5, 8 through 10, Peter says, be of sober spirit. Boy, if there's one guy would know this one, it would be Peter. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Today, 
That's all I heard on the news media in the Birmingham area, wasn't it? All the way to 6 o'clock until this guy blew his brains out. Right? Be on the alert. Be on the alert. Be on the alert. Be on the alert. This is what Peter is saying about the Satan. Saying to the believer, be on the alert. Be on the alert. Be on the alert. See, that's what he's saying. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Where did he get that idea? That's reconnaissance. He got that out of the book of Job. Same deal, except he describes him as a roaring lion. He, he gives him a, a modern twist to it. And he says, but resist him. How? Firm in your faith. Where does faith come from? Romans 10, 17. Faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. You got no faith. You got no faith. If you don't study the Word of God, you got no faith. If you got no faith, you got no motor. You you've got a good-looking car, but you have to push it. Hey, you want to ride? Hey, you want to go to the mall with me? Okay, it's my car. I steer. Push. Resist. See, you got to have the Word of God, to have faith, and faith is what moves mountains in your life. Those obstacles, you look at like, all I got is a spoon, and there is a mountain I've got to get rid of. A spoon. How big is it? I bet you got a big spoon. Now I got one of these little... I got a plastic ice cream cone. Yeah, that's what I got. Well, how long do you think it's going to take you to move that mountain? Well, I'm not very good at math. Well, I can see that. Well, and a guy comes along and says, I can tell you how to move it. I can, help. I can tell you how to move it before you get up from your knees. Before I do what? Before you get up from your knees. What I, why would I be on my knees? Because the only way you're going to move that is through prayer. The only way you can move that mountain is by God Almighty. And the only way you're going to get to do that with your name attached to it is you're going to have to pray in the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit and pray according to the will of God and He'll move that mountain before you get up from your knees. You believe that? Amen. You better believe it. This is what the Christian life's about. It's not whether you're counting in attendance on Sunday. Can you move a mountain in your life? This obstacle that's in your life is bigger than your life. It's bigger than 12 people's life. It's, it's impossible. God specializes in the impossible. What is impossible for man is a possibility with God. It's an absolute. God could do anything. He told that. He told that to Sarah and Abraham when they were a hundred years old. They were going to have a baby, and she laughed. You know, one of those belly laughs, like, <laughs> "Yeah, right." And he said, "Is there anything too difficult?" Let me ask you a question, honey. Is anything too difficult for the Lord? <coughs> well, uh, <coughs> well, let me think. <coughs> yeah, me. Well, I'm going to move a mountain for you. I'm going to move a mountain for you. But you're going to have to believe that I'm going to put a baby in your womb this year and, that ba and you're going to live to raise it. Oh, you might be, listen, you might be the oldest mother in the nursery. You're going to impress all the young ones because they, get, they are impressed with your energy and with your vitality and with your commitment. That's how God does. Listen, what, what mountain do you have? Oh, I will never. Oh, I will never resolve this. Oh, I will never resolve that. Oh, I will never get that done. Yeah, put that spoon down. Pick up the word of God. Put that spoon down. Of course you're not going to do it. This is not about you. This is about the magnificent God. This will cause you on Sunday to sing Amazing Grace and believe it. 
Hoo-ah. So what I'm saying, they, the choir comes out now and sings, is there any mountain too big for God to move? Is there any mountain too big for God to move? Listen, you better not say there is. Well, I got a couple in my life. I don't see how they're going to be done. Well, if you said that from standing up or on your knees. Have you, have you discussed with God whether or not this is the right thing to pray about? Have you consulted the word of God? Because if you pray according to his will, 1 John 5, 14 and 15, he hears you. If he hears you, he will, he will give you the pr prayer you requested. He may not give it with your expectations, but he will answer the prayer on his expectations. He'll give you what pleases him, whether it pleases you or not. Whoa. So he runs reconnaissance. Peter says he's still running reconnaissance. He's running reconnaissance in the church. Knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brothers who are in the world after you have suffered for a while. Do you know there are three categories of suffering? Just like there's three classifications of the will of God. Did you know that? Yeah, sure. Some people do because they go to church here. Right? Give me one. Self-induced misery. You know that one, don't you? I don't have to teach that one. You could teach. Yeah? You could stand up and teach an hour and that. Maybe a week. Then you got undeserved suffering. That's what Job went through. This is to glorify God, buddy. This is to reach people you would never reach. Listen, you, uh, I've been in this business a long time. It's not a business. I, I've been in this ministry a long time. And I've seen people go through all kinds of things. And every time anybody had this type of suffering and turned it into ministry, God puts you in some of the most interesting places. I've seen people, several people here have had cancer. And they go to cancer treatment centers. They would never have gone there had they not had cancer. I mean, I don't know what he says. Well, I'm taking my lunch break today. I'm on a ministry. I'm going to the, uh, the cancer center. I'm going to spend my lunch at the can cancer center. What are you going to do there? Well, I'm just going there and have lunch. Well, who does that? Right? I'll tell you who does it. The person who's got cancer. That's where he winds up. You know, he winds up with people he would have never known, and they all have something in common, and he's able to work from that common denominator into the com that commonality of Jesus Christ. Because this is a mountain that you got to have moved, baby. And why do you think you're there? You're there Tell them how to move mountains. And listen, the mountain they may need to may need need not to move, and God will show them is their cancer. The cancer is where the ministry is. Listen, you're going to die from something. It don't matter. You're going to die on the day God chose you to die, just like the day you were born. Dying is not a deal. It's not a deal breaker. You're going to die from something. Who cares? Turn that sucker into a ministry. Buddy, I tell you, when I see that stuff happens, listen, when my wife goes to the hospital like she just did for 13 days, we, listen, that hospital becomes a ministry for us. My whole family, that's what about it. Every nurse that comes in, every doctor comes in, every, every little lady comes in to clean the floor, we got her. We're not there for the hospital. We're there for Jesus Christ. My life ain't about a hospital. Mine's not about a garage. I don't take my car in just for a garage. I take it in for a ministry. I don't go in and just have a hamburger. I go in to have a ministry. I expect God to give me people. Hoo-ah. That's what my life's about. My life's about carrying a cross. Carrying a cross that they can't see until I tell them. Then they'll see it. Well, anyhow. I can't talk about other people, but I can talk about me. And then you got divine discipline. Divine discipline. Those are three categories of suffering in your life. This is Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Here's, number, here's point number two. <laughs> point number two. 
I guess we're going to get through this tonight, aren't we? <laughs> Satan's reconnaissance. Sa listen, you, you know who else ought to be... Mo listen to me. Here's Satan's reconnaissance out, right? Sneaking behind the bushes. See, he's a, he, he, he's, a, he's a master disguiser. He'll come out as an angel of light if he needs to preach. <laughs> he's a master sky. He's a he's a he's an angel of darkness that appears like light. See, and he he's a disguiser. He 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 comes out if he wants to go boo. Then he's got a hatchet and goes like, hey, I'm serious. He's a master disguiser. Second Second Corinthians eleven fourteen. He's a master disguiser. And he roams around the earth, disguise himself, all different kinds of people. Hi, yeah, I got the deal of a lifetime. You give me $12 and I'll show you how to turn it into $6 trillion. <laughs> Give it to God who can multiply it a hundred times. That guy can't get it. It's in his hand, from your hand to mine. Thank you, dear friend. You put that 12, you put that money in the hand of God, he'll multiply it hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold. Never come back void. Now, I'm not pushing you to give any money here. I'm just telling you the truth. I don't care where you put it. Except in the hands of somebody who disguises himself as the devil. Satan's reconnaissance in the angelic conflict. AC is angelic conflict, not air conditioning. <laughs> Satan's reconnaissance is AC. Angelic conflict is for strategy to attack the spiritually advancing believer. That's why he runs kind of, Didn't we see it in Job? Didn't we see it by Peter? Yeah, he's running reconnaissance. What's his purpose of reconnaissance? Figuring out how to get you. How to get you. Listen to Ephesians 4.27. Do not give the devil an opportunity. Look through the people first. Don't give him an opportunity. This word is topos. The word topos in the Greek language, the word opportunity, uh, I think in some translations they say a foot, a foothold. Don't give him a foothold. Other, but this word topos means a place. Don't give him a, listen, don't give him an inch, he'll take a what? Don't give him a toe, he'll take a foot, a leg, because he wants a whole deal. Right? This is what you don't do. That's topaz. Don't give the devil any space. No room at the end. Hang that sign out. No room at the end. God has already said there's a hedge. Listen, he's already, for a church age believer, this hedge is that you belong to God in Christ. Nobody can get you out of those hands. Nobody. That's, that's your hedge. The confidence that you have that I'm secure in God, in Christ, forever. John 10th chapter 28 through 30. One of my very lovely verses. Ephesians 4.21. Do not give the devil a foothold. Don't give him an inch because he's not after an inch. He's after a mile. Don't give him. Listen. I preach this to high school, ki high school kids all the time. And every once in a while, some will listen. And for those kids, I'm forever thankful because they're the shakers and movers for Christ for the next generation. But I'm going to show you something. Now, don't write verse 27. Don't give him what? Don't give him any space. Don't let him in. Don't let him. I don't care what he's selling. Don't buy. Watch this. And I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you what he does if he gets a space in your life, if he can get a foot in the door, let me show you. Let's, let's go to Ephesians. I'm going to show you this because I only read one verse. So I'm going to show you the big picture. Here's what happens. Here's here. And listen, this is how he gets in. And this is where he's going to take the inch to a mile. He's going to push an inch to a mile. Fourth chapter. I read verse 27. So let's go back. Let's go back. Uh, back to, to Ephesians, where he got verse 22, a former manner of life, that's before you were saved, right? And you've got been corrupted in deceit and the worldly way of going. We're going to stop that. That's a former life. I'm not living that life anymore. Pfft, I'm done with it. 
they get, get sick of it to be done with it, but you should be done with it. And so he tells you to put it off, lay aside the old self in verse 22, and then he tells you to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's the word of God. That's Romans 12, 2. And put on the new self, which in the likes of God created in righteousness, holiness, and truth. Now watch. Now watch this. See, now I drop down to verse 27. See, I drop down to verse 27. Do not give the devil any space. Don't let him get a foothold in your life. Let me tell you how he does it. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, falsehood speak truth. Now look for the positive because the negative is how he gets in. Do you understand? The negative is how he gets in. Speaking falsehood. What you should be doing is telling the truth. You shouldn't be lying. You shouldn't be lying your britches off. Each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry. Watch the second one. Be angry and yet do not sin. In other words, righteous indignation. But listen, he says, if you, watch the next phase. But if you do sin, correct it before the sun goes down. In other words, before you go to bed. You know, my grandmother, she wasn't a believer. When I was a kid growing up, my grandmother always told me, and, she, and she's lived by this rule. Now, I don't know where she got it. She might have got it from the Bible as a kid. But my grandmother would never let anybody go to bed if there was a disagreement that day. If I, if I got a, and I very seldom got a, a spanking because the Lord knew I was going to be a preacher. <laughs> I, just, I watched the older ones get whippings, and I learned how to not get them. You know what I'm saying? I learned what not to do to get them. I, I was really sneaky. You're absolutely right, aren't you? I was sneaky. But look, she always had this saying, don't let the sun go down until that's corrected. My grandmother lived by that. When I got married, the first, she pulled me aside and she said, listen, I'm going to give you that piece of advice. You know, this is, this is grandma's line, and it was grandma. She told everybody this. Never go to bed. And I tell you, there were, there were nights when I was, I would, I was ready to sleep on the couch. I didn't. Because when you're young, you're horny and things, but I didn't sleep on the couch. But, so I slept. But I could get up in the middle. of I couldn't do it. I could not go to sleep. I hear my grandmother go like, psst, psst, Ronnie, Ronnie, psst. Are you going to sleep? With that, with that ill feeling between you and your wife? Ronnie, psst, psst, psst. I can hear, I, go, I wake up and go like, what? Ronnie, get up. You get Jane. What do you want? We got to get something settled before we can go to sleep. I'm already asleep. No, 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 no. This can't happen. What was that wonderful advice or not? <laughs> it was great. Okay, so do not let the sun go down on, upon your anger. Get it corrected. Look at then verse 27. See, don't get. See, he said that. Then he goes on. Look, it, don't give the devil a plate. You know how he got that? You know how the devil got in your bedroom? You know how the devil got in your house? You know how the devil got in your marriage? You know how this worked? <laughs> there it is. Come on. And then look at verse 28. He goes on. He said, don't steal. Don't steal. Look, look. He got me on this when I was a young Christian. He would go like, hey, that, uh, uh, that passage. I'd read that passage. And he'd go like, uh, that ballpoint pen you got, Ron? Uh-huh. Where'd you get that? What? Where did you get the ballpoint pen? Where'd you get the pen you got? Uh, well, what's it say on the pen, Ron? It says Southern Natural Gas. <laughs> Southern, well, where could a, that pen just, did it, how did that pen get there? Uh, I took it from work. Well, is that part of your job description, Ron? I went, look, it's a pin. It's a pin. Well, and then I could hear my grandmother, today it's a pin, tomorrow it's a truck. And <laughs> You know what I had to do tomorrow? I took that pin back. I took that pin back and put it. You go to me, but it's just a pin. Mm -mm, mm -mm. You see, he said, no, you got to learn. Stealing stealing. I don't care what it is. Stealing is stealing. Now, maybe you forgot to take it. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you think, well, look, they don't pay me enough. They don't pay you enough to steal? What, what are you talking about? 
let him who steals steal no longer. Let him rather labor, performing work with his hands. Watch. So he can give, so he can be charitable with his money. In order that he may have something to share with him who has a need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. Oh boy, there he's got us. But only such a word as is good for the edifying of the other person. Never, never use words to tear somebody down. Always use them. Listen, don't gossip about somebody. It doesn't make you better to gossip about them. It doesn't make you better. See? It is good for edification, for building the other purpose. Use words that edify people, not words that tear them down. According to the need of the moment, that, they, that, that it, the words, may give grace to those who hear. Give them grace. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God for whom you were sealed to the day of redemption. Then watch how he closes out. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, slander, uh, clamor be put away from you along with malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving, just as God in Christ forgave you. See, in the midst of this stuff going on in the church of Ephesus. This was the church of Ephesus. This, he preached his sermon like he knew what was going on, like God does. And in the middle of this, he stops and gives a break and says, you know what's going on? The devil's, the devil's able to get space in your life. He's able to get a foothold into your life. Don't give it to them. Do not give that to them. And I'll tell you what will run them off. It's what he tells you to do in place of it. Don't steal. Go out and get a good job. Get, get enough money. Listen. You, I don't care what you make. You should always have a little bit left to give somebody a need. That's part of your paycheck. When you spend it all on yourself, we know who you are. No, you haven't been paying no attention to the Word of God. I can tell you that. I'm not talking about tithing. I'm talking about being charitable. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. In 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, verse 11, I've got to wrap this up. There is no advantage. No advantage will be taken of us by Satan. See, there were some of the ways he can get in. We are not ignorant of his schemes. This ta, there's a definite article, ta, and then noima in the Greek. And this word with a definite article means that which is thought out and planned in your mind. Paul, listen, Paul uses it in an interesting way in Romans, the 13th chapter, 13 and 14, when he says, make no provision for the flesh in regard to the fulfillment of its lust. He says, don't be planning ahead. You, you got a date with this little girl tonight. Don't be planning ahead. Don't be planning ahead how, what you're going to do with her. That's not godly. Why you spend so much time on your car? What you trying to do? How come we're going to do this? And how come that? What, what's your motive? What's your motive? Satan attacks the faith system in a believer. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4. Paul gives the first family of the human race as an example. He says about, in 2 Corinthians 11.3, about Eve, I am afraid, least as the serpent, Satan, deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds, tanoima, that same word, your minds, and it doesn't mean your minds because there's a word noose. He's talking about your mind that you use as a system to plot things. It, it, that's not the word mind. It's the way you use your mind to plot things. Your mind should be led astray. I am afraid lest the serpent deceived Eve by your craftiness. Your minds should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. You know, here it is. This is how simple this is. This is not complicated. This is simple. When you get ready to do something or say something or, 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 or that, listen. Is this, is this good and healthy for Christ? Will this please him? 
Is this, is this what Christ, and listen, because traveling with you, <laughs> you're a mobile church. What, don't you know your body's the temple of God? Because the Holy Spirit dwells there, third member of the Godhead? Yeah. Tough night, isn't it? Huh? You had a tough night here? Huh? Why do you think God brought you here tonight? You say, well, God didn't bring me here tonight. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. What you going to do with it? That's the question. What you going to do with it? We don't have no chance encounters here. There are none. We're not in the chance encounter business. There's no chance you're here tonight. It's what you do with it. You can walk out, shake it off, and go back out there in the world. You can go back out there and live the same old hum yum, mediocrity world life. Or you get serious with the Lord Jesus Christ. The people who get serious, they're, they're world changers. They shake the world for Christ. They threaten the Satan. They threaten him. They make his life miserable. And what better joy to make God happy and him miserable is the best day you could ever have. Let us pray. Give me a moment of silence. You know what the God has got in your heart. If you've never believed the gospel of Jesus Christ, he brought here you tonight to have that examination of you. What must I do to be saved? Why should I be saved? Because you're a sinner. Christ came into the world to save sinners. What must I do to be saved? You've got to believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. You believe it, you're saved. You don't believe it, you're lost. If you die lost, you'll go to hell. I mean, that's straightforward, isn't it? Nobody beating around a bush with you here. Father, we thank you tonight for the love and mercy and grace of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man, none, can come to the Father except through me. I pray, Father, tonight, every person, the sound of our voice, by automobile here and by internet across the world, would understand that important issue. Believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God to save you. You don't save yourself. It is the power of the gospel that saves you when you believe. I pray that, Father, for us here tonight and for those who are visiting with us by Internet. In Jesus' name, amen.